to our scripture reflection for the fourth Sunday of Easter. I invite you to listen to a brief scripture passage from the Gospel of John. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can take them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one can take them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Gospel of the Lord. As I was reflecting upon this short passage, I was taken back to one of my favorite movies and a particular scene in that movie, and that movie is Apollo 13. This is the story back in the, I think it's the early 70s, of a mission to the moon. It would have been the second or third trip to the moon. And uh, it starts out well, but partway through, maybe the first or second day, there is an explosion of an unknown origin that takes place on the spacecraft. And the result of that explosion is that uh, the spacecraft loses power, it has to be shut down, a decision has to be made uh, to just let the capsule go around the moon and let the moon's gravity point it back in the direction of the Earth. And partway during the return trip, when all the computers and everything are shut down, uh, a determination is made that a course correction is necessary. And so the astronauts say to the people in Houston, okay, just give us a little bit of time to power up our computers so that we can get this ready for this course correction. And Houston tells them, no, you cannot turn the computers back on because you don't have enough power to do that. And the astronauts say, you mean we have to do this blind? And after a little conversation, uh, they come to the conclusion that if we can look out our capsule window and get a fixed point of reference from everything else that is in the background, then perhaps manually we can maneuver the spacecraft so that uh, we don't come in too steep and crash and burn or come in too lightly and skip off the Earth's atmosphere to forever move into the darkness of space. So <clears throat> they realize that uh, if they're going to attempt this and they look out the window, the Earth, the Earth itself, is right in that window. And so all they have to do is keep that Earth in that window. And so when they cut the power, Earth is there. And they look at one another and say, this is going to take all three of us. One's going to have to steer, one's going to have to keep time, and the other one's going to have to be in charge of the thrust or the power. So they count down and they get started, and as soon as uh, they try to make the course correction, they encounter a lot of turbulence. The spacecraft go going this way and that way and this way and that way, and it seems like uh, they're really going to be in trouble. And uh, just at the very last second, the Earth comes into view in that window. They shut the power off, and Houston says to them, that's good enough. And of course, we you know the end of the story is they make it back safely to the Earth just uh, a day or two later. I would like to suggest that this story of Apollo 13 and this particular episode of the course correction can serve as an analogy for us to understand this short gospel passage that we just heard. So let's take it step by step. There was an explosion on the spacecraft that caused some disruption. I would like to suggest that there has been an explosion of voices in our world, an explosion of voices, some of which are from politicians. We just had a great deal of exposure to political ads leading up to the primary election this past week. And as soon as those <clears throat> ads were over because of the primary election, a whole new set of ads began looking forward to the next election. There is an explosion of voices of religious leaders or people claiming to speak on certain issues with religious authority. Uh, there is an explosion of uh, 
people on social media offering all kinds of theories about different things. There is an explosion of voices having to do with pundits offering their take on <clears throat> just about any issue you can imagine, and an explosion of voices trying to sell us things. This the interests at work in this explosion of voices seem to be things like the desire to acquire or retain power, uh, the desire for making money, or maybe just the desire for the good life. And an example of how voices can explode all around us <clears throat> happened this past week when there was the release of the draft document, the leak of the draft document of the U.S. Supreme Court over the pending decision regarding Roe versus Wade. Within milliseconds, it seemed, all over the media, there were people expressing dismay, concern, all kinds of opinions about this. This explosion of voices has resulted in some uncertainty, disorientation, confusion, wondering what the truth of some things are, causing us to wonder what voices ought we to listen to, and how do we respond to those voices. And all of this then impacts our actual lived experience, and that impact is all too easy to name. There is <clears throat> polarization and division in our society, and often even in our own families. There is an increase in extremism, behaviors and ideas and speech that seemed uh, inconceivable not all that long ago, now are looking more and more normalized. There is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in this lived experience, there we are told by uh, mental health professionals that more and more people are experiencing serious mental health issues. There is an impact on the confidence we have in so many of the institutions that we used to take for granted in our society. And there seems to be a certain sense of distrust that is bred as a result of all of this. So that we kind of feel like we're losing our bearings. And it seems that uh, life itself and civilization are threatened. And so we too, I think, now to go back to the Apollo 13 example, we too may need a course correction. And one that might be <clears throat> a little tricky, because if we come in too steep, we might crash and burn. Or if we come in not steep enough, then we might drift off into everlasting darkness. In the movie Apollo 13, <clears throat> what was needed for the course correction was a fixed point of reference. So for our course correction, I'm going to suggest that our fixed point of reference is the voice of the shepherd that we heard about in this gospel story. Now to say that the voice of the shepherd is our fixed point of reference doesn't mean that the voice of the shepherd is the only voice that we hear, but rather it is to say that the voice of the shepherd becomes a kind of life-giving perspective <clears throat> through which we can assess all these other voices and make a determination of how we are to respond. Do we listen and follow? Do we probe more deeply? Do we accept with a grain of salt? Do we challenge? Do we ignore them? All of these are ways that listening to the voice of the shepherd can help us in this course correction. But then, of course, the question is raised, how do we listen to the voice of the shepherd? And how do we know it's the shepherd's voice in the first place? And the easy answer to that is by cultivating a relationship with the shepherd so that that voice becomes more familiar, so that when we hear it, we'll recognize it. And that relationship is cultivated by persistent and prayerful reflection on the scriptures and on our liturgical experience, so that if we hear voices in the wider society that are inconsistent with or contradictory to what we hear in those sources, uh, we are on the alert to listen more carefully to what the shepherd might be seeing. And also, we can cultivate that relationship by prayerfully and persistently reflecting on our lived experience of being Christian. 
What does it mean to be in a situation where people are loving one another, or are forgiving one another, or serving one another, or being in community with one another? In all of those kinds of reflections, we can sharpen our attentiveness to the voice of the shepherd so that we might hear it more clearly and consistently. But just as in the story of the Apollo 13, it was necessary for all three astronauts on that capsule to work together to keep that fixed point of reference firmly in view, so too it is necessary for all of us who are attempting to be faithful Christians to listen together to the voice of the shepherd. And that's important because no one of us has uh, exclusive and infallible kind of ears for what the voice of the shepherd might be saying. We might hear only partially. We might hear um, with some sense of distortion or misunderstanding. And we need each other to help hear clearly what the voice of the shepherd is saying. I'm reminded here of our recent conversations about synodality, how the, it is the conviction that the Spirit, which helps us to hear the voice of the shepherd, is at work in all members of the church, not just the ordained. It is the even more remarkable conviction that we might hear the voice of the, the shepherd as the Spirit prompts it in people who aren't even ostensibly Christian. It is the conviction that synodality, listening together, is part and parcel of the very nature of what it means to be church. But we not only listen together, we follow together. We follow together and being pay attention to what our experience of journeying together is all about, continuing to listen to the voice of the shepherd. But we follow together because if we don't follow, then what happens is the voice of the shepherd becomes a little fainter maybe a little less distinct, a little harder to hear. And if that happens, then perhaps we find ourselves unwittingly in need of still additional course corrections. When the astronauts on the Apollo 13 mission did their course correction, one of the things that immediately happened was turbulence. They were all over the place. I think it's likely that if we listen together to the voice of the shepherd, we too might encounter some turbulence. We, there might be some pushback, some resistance, and perhaps maybe even some persecution. And perhaps a word about the relationship between faith and social issues or faith and politics is opportune here. Some would say that faith and these political issues or social issues should be kept separate from one another. Others might easily say that, well, faith means I align myself with this party or this party or with this issue. Uh, but it seems to me that there needs to be some kind of interrelationship between faith and politics and our social issues, or else we risk that the voice of the shepherd has nothing to say about those issues. Um, and I'll remind you again what I've said, uh, quoted before, the 71 Synod of Bishops, which said, action on behalf of justice and participation for the transformation of the world seems to us fully constitutive of, uh, constitutive aspect of the preaching of the gospel. Lastly, we saw in the story of uh, Apollo 13 that when they were able to keep their eyes fixed on that one point of reference and work together, that they did in fact make a course correction that brought them back to earth again alive. And so too, our attempts to listen to the voice of the shepherd together through all the turbulence will bring us to life. Jesus says, the voice of the shepherd will give them eternal life, and no one of them will perish. So the invitation for us today, perhaps thinking through the analogy of the mission of Apollo 13, is to listen together and respond together to the voice of the shepherd so that we might indeed have eternal life. 
Amen. As a prayer, I would like to share with you uh, something I found on the internet in the Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Uh, and I invite you to pray it with me. I'm just going to make some slight adaptations to it. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you desire to speak to us every day, guiding us in spirit and in truth to obey your word and enjoy an abundant life. We thank you that you have called us your friends and that we may come boldly to the throne of grace to find help whenever we have a need in our lives. Lord, your word says that when we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. So we draw near to you today. We seek your face, your truth, and your word for our lives. We want to know you more, hear you more, and obey you more. Your word says your sheep know your voice, and we will not follow the voice of a stranger. Help us to know your voice, and not be deceived by any other voice. Help us to guard our hearts from the influences of this world and the people around us. Help us not to be deceived, but to view all thoughts and decisions through the lens of righteousness. As we seek to hear you today for instruction, correction, and guidance, help us to confirm your voice through your word. You said if we ask for wisdom, you will give it to us liberally. So we are asking for wisdom in the name of Jesus to hear you clearly and consistently today and every day. Help us to feel confident in knowing that we hear your voice. We praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. See you. 